Okay, well, once again, we have a fabulously distinguished uh, uh, panel. Uh, once again, I'm going to start by not introducing uh, Judge O'Malley, who you just heard. Uh, uh, to her left uh, is the Honorable Lucy Coe uh, on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. Um, Judge Coe has, uh, uh, is a relatively recent appointee to the bench, but uh, was a, a patent litigator, among other things, uh, before joining the bench. and. Um, uh, and has had a number of uh, interesting and high-profile patent cases even in her short time on the bench. Uh, to her left is Ed Reines. Um, Ed Reines is a well-known patent practitioner at uh, Weill Gottschall uh, here in Silicon Valley uh, and also a leader in the Federal Circuit Bar Association. Uh, to his left, if I can see through the uh, glare, is Michelle Lee. Uh, Michelle Lee has uh, been in charge of patents at Google for a very long time, uh, and, uh, and uh, before that had a, uh, a career as a patent lawyer in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, then finally, uh, on the far left, we have John Duffy. Uh, John Duffy is an academic uh, who specializes in patent law and who recently joined the University of Virginia faculty. Uh, uh, he is also a, uh, a practicing lawyer and has been involved in litigating a number of uh, patent cases in the, in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, district court and court of appeals relationships. Uh, and I think we can't uh, start talking about the district court federal circuit relationship without uh, uh, mentioning uh, claim construction and uh, what district court judges have always talked about, which is the, the question of claim construction reversal rates. Now, I actually have one and, and only one slide, if this works. Um, and uh, this, like the, uh, uh, like the data slide in the central reexamination unit, uh, uh, is sufficiently exciting that I just want to leave it up there for uh, lots of <laughs> periods of time. This is data that uh, Jonas Anderson and Peter Minnell have put together on claim construction reversal rates, a rolling average uh, uh, of the last 75 cases. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of spiking and variation because cases uh, 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 differ from time to time. But if you uh, work out the numbers, what you find is that between 2002 and 2005, when the Phillips case was decided, uh, the reversal rate was hovering somewhere around 40% uh, in claim construction cases. Uh, sometime around Phillips, and, and we can talk about exactly when and, and therefore exactly why, uh, that reversal rate started to go down. And in the last several years, through the data is through 2011, it's been more on the order of 25% uh, um, uh, reversal rate, which is, you know, a district court judge might argue still a lot, uh, but it's certainly a lot less than it was. Um, let me ask the panel, um, is this, is 40% is too high? Is 25% too high? Is this a function of treating this as a question of law rather than a question of fact? Are there ways we can bring down the claim construction reversal rate? Well, I, d just so you, you have it in perspective, the average reversal rate in the regional circuits of district court decisions is somewhere between 17 and 20 percent, depending on who you listen to and, and uh, you know, who's done the statistical analysis and, and, and which circuit you're focusing on. Um, so 25 percent is not that different, especially if you realize that, that the district court cases that are being reviewed, many of them are simple sentencing decisions. There are things that would automatically be subject to being affirmed. Um, so I don't know that anyone has ever done a, an, an analysis of the number of times that a district court decision in a complex case is reversed. Do you know, Mark? So, no, I don't. So, I mean, so, to, so to keep the numbers in perspective, I think that it, it, it's, it's not as far off now. I mean, I think it certainly was um, before Phillips. It's not as far off now. I mean, I still think, you know, I, I wrote a, a dissent in Retractable. I, I still think that, it, that it's too high. And I think that there are lots of times where it would be easy to give deference to the district court decision making. In that case, we had two district judges, both well-respected district judges who had construed the claim the same way and, and we reversed. Um, and that, I believe, has a petition for cert pending in that case. But I just, I don't know that the, that the Supreme Court's going to take up Cyborg. I think it's going to be up to us to take up Cyborg if it ever happens. Judge Coe, you in favor of deference? <laughs> of course. Um, I, I, I do think that there are factual findings that um, underpin a claim construction 
and it should be given some deference. I also think that some of the reversal rate may also just be due to the fact that we have a big circuit. I think when you have like the first circuit where there are six judges getting permutations of three is a much more narrow scope. And so I think the law is more harmonized. But when you have a big circuit like the Ninth Circuit or even the Federal Circuit, which is on the bigger side, um, I think that also causes more variation. I also want to make the point that the record is different. Um, when a district judge makes a claim construction decision, they haven't had the benefit of all the expert discovery, summary judgment, JML motions, trial, whereas generally when it's being reviewed by the Federal Circuit, it's a much more complete and developed record. And I think that can also uh, explain some of the, the variation and why people come out differently. And these are really, you know, complicated questions and often the answer's not as clear as we would like. What I'd add in terms of improving the situation is uh, fo focusing and honing down district court litigation uh, in terms of what the litigants do earlier. There's a little bit of a, uh, a hide the ball issue that comes up with parties presenting you know, 10, 15, 20 claim terms to a district court without the district court knowing which one is the highest priority for resolution of litigation and then you get you know fast forward a year or two or three and in the federal circuit all of a sudden everybody's a genius about this one term and there's 60 pages of you know federal circuit briefing on it and potentially as judge Coe alluded to expert testimony from the trial that wasn't even in the possession of the district court um, so i think that one of the next frontiers for the management of civil litigation is getting cases to hone down earlier in the district court. And I, and I don't think that really steps on anyone's rights. It's forcing parties to exercise discipline in terms of what they're going to push. It's, it's easy to just delay that. Everyone's got a little procrastination in them. But if you put a little pressure and discipline on litigants to make choices earlier, it just makes it so much easier for the rest of the participants. And uh, one of the things that the uh, Federal Circuit Advisory Council is now looking at, we've got another uh, committee that's looking at maybe a model order or some other kind of resource for people to use to think about limiting the number of claims in cases um, or limiting, uh, likewise, the number of prior art references. People routinely identify 100 prior art references and how are you supposed to know which claim term is going to end up mattering in the context of that prior art reference later on. It's really unfair to the district court judge to have so much focus on one issue later when they've got, you know, kind of a huge morass of issues at this earlier point. Yeah. John, Michelle? Yeah, so while I recognize that Cyborg said that claim construction is a question of law to be reviewed de novo, uh, the Supreme Court in Markman said that it was a mongrel practice with mixed questions of law and fact. And I guess that's probably where I come out to is that I do believe that some level of deference should be given to the district court. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of work that is put into the claim construction arguments, the testimony that's presented to the district judges, the questions they're able to ask, right? And to review that de novo, um, given underlying fact questions, uh, seems a little suspect. And from a business perspective, right, as an in-house counsel trying to run a business, um, Clearly, we would prefer much greater certainty earlier on. I mean, in our design arounds and so forth, so there are practical implications to um, being able to rely upon an opinion more so. I mean, if it's wrong, then go up on appeal and have it be reviewed by something other than de novo. But you know, when you're trying to run a business, certainty is always better. One thing that's important to remember, if you start talking about deference to a district court or deference in general, you need to equate that in your mind with difference. If you give deference to district judges, that means that if district judge A reaches one decision and interprets the claim to mean A, and district judge over on the other side of the country interprets it to mean B, if you truly mean deference, you affirm both of those decisions if they are reasonable. That's the negative side of deference. And you can't not really escape that. You can't say, oh, that will never happen, or we will just sort of we'll reverse the, the second person, because that's a sort of deference of sort of the first district judge is sort of a bear trap, right? You, you sort of, if you get to it first, you'll get to construe the claim for the entire country. And that's not a really great alternative. 
This issue of, of and I actually agree with Mich what Michelle said and what many of uh, the judges have said, that, that I, I think it is true that it is a mongrel practice, as the Supreme Court said. It is a, a question that involves both uh, law and fact. There is, outside of patent law, there is an extensive body of law on how to review mixed, so-called mixed questions of law and fact. You can do a Lexis search on it. You'll find two things. One, the law's a mess. Everywhere, not just in this area, but everywhere the law's a mess. Although the dominant strain is that they're reviewed de novo. So that even in other areas, where, there, where, where courts, sophisticated courts say, this is a mixed question of law or fact because what they mean when they say it's a question of law, they mean they want it uniform. They want it, the ultimate resolution to have uniformity throughout the country. They recognize that they can't give deference in a strong form, because if they do give deference, they have to affirm divergent opinions. And that's the real, that's the other side that I think led the Supreme Court to say, I think would, I think in, th in this area too, would lead the Supreme Court to say, it, if they took the case, which I, I agree they probably would not, but I think if they did take the case, they would probably say it's, it's a question of law that will be reviewed de novo, and that Cyborg, despite its negative consequences, is the least bad, uh, uh, con uh, least bad rule. Is there a way to sort of uh, navigate a middle ground between those that is, uh, Cyborg says it is a question of law and it is reviewed de novo. John, I think you just suggested we might say it's a quest mixed question of law and fact, and it is reviewed de novo. Uh, and in yes. other circuits, we've done that. So one question is, is there a way to acknowledge the factual component of claim construction and implement that in a way that doesn't uh, necessarily mean we get rid of de novo review, but still gives room for evidence to be developed in the district court? Well, in, 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 I think certainly to the extent that, you, that, that, that there's language in Cyborg that, 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 that says, oh, it's a pure question of law or anything like that, I think that's not accurate. That, that sort of denies what I think a lot of district judges see in a Markman hearing, that they see, they want to hear from experts, they have to decide relatively uh, complex uh, issues. Um, so I think that changing it and saying it is a, a mixed question of law, in fact, I think would be more honest. But then still, I think the dominant strain of law, not the only strain of law, the, 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 the appellate court case law on the, mix, the, the standard for review of mixed questions of law, in fact, is a morass in all, lots of different areas. But I think the dominant strain is, uh, the majority rule is, is de novo review in that area. There is a way, which I suggested a few years ago in an article, which is what uh, courts do in other areas sometimes, which is if there's an administrative agency, uh, you can defer to that and get uniformity. Um, so you could, ref you could use a, an administrative law doctrine called primary jurisdiction that I'm sure Artie teaches uh, her students um, and refer the issue to the patent office. And I wrote that up a few years ago and said, uh, and everybody said no, no district judge would ever do that. And, uh, and that still has remained true. Um, on the other hand, if the Supreme Court were ever presented with that, I think they would think that is, that is a solution that's solidly grounded in administrative law and Supreme Court case law, and it solves the problem. As many administrative law s solutions do, it solves the problem. You can give deference but still have national uniformity. So you'd refer, you'd refer it to the patent office, refer an actual litigation to the patent office to construe the patent claims. That's right. You'd ask for an advisory opinion from the patent office. And since, uh, since patent office is an administrative agency and not a, uh, not a court, it can give out advisory opinions, which is what other agencies do. And they, don't, they, they have statutory authority of that to give out advisory opinions under the Administrative Procedure Act, which generally authorizes uh, agencies to give out advisory opinions. And this is all detailed in an, in an article I did before tenure, but it didn't stop me from getting tenure, <laughs> which was surprising, I think, because I, I think nobody read it. Um, but, but, um, but, but that's the way, I mean, that's, a, that's an administrative solution, and many administrative solutions are designed to create deference to a lower, to a fact finder, but still achieve national uniformity, because the alternative is you grant deference to a, a fact finder who's, that's a district court, then you have to accept regional variation. I mean, um, I mean, I, I reluctantly disagree with uh, John on the, on the benefits of uniformity. I mean, f at a few different levels. First, there's all kinds of areas in patent cases where there's fact questions where we don't have uniformity, invalidity, 
infringement, the way the claims are applied, uh, 112, I mean, there's just so many. And then when you look at what the whole point of this conference is, different institutions were hardly honing towards uniformity by creating, you know, at least three different decision makers um, on, you know, on, on some of the similar or same questions. Uh, and I don't know what's so bad about having construction one way in one case and one in the other. I had to experience over the last few months in a, in a very large case um, where the, the district court said the claim was construed once before, and even though you're making a different argument with a different coloring complexion, in other words, you have a different accused product, so you're making a different kind of argument that wasn't tendered before, we're bound under the doctrine of stare decisis to, to apply the original construction because the Federal Circuit affirmed, which I don't think makes sense and certainly doesn't make equity. So I, 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 to me, I don't have John's uh, thirst for uniformity on this issue. I think letting each record play itself out, each district judge, yes, you'll have some awkward circumstances on appeal where there's mutual appeals coming up, like the Rambus situation that recently occurred. Um, but, you know, that's not, not, nothing's perfect. I want to say, I, I, I actually agree with some, I just wanted to point out this is a hard issue, and that if, you're, if you want to say you want difference, you have to agree to difference. And I'm, I'm willing to think maybe difference is okay, but you can't sweep that problem under the, under the carpet. And, I, and I, I think I, you're I, right about that. Well, I, I would think that the scenario where multiple district judges are construing the same patent is going to be a fairly limited uh, occurrence because with the MDL uh, option as well as transfer, I mean, I, I'm generally not going to construe a case that someone else is construing. I'm going to transfer that case out. So first of all, I think the universe of scenarios where multiple district judges are construing the same patent is going to be fairly limited. Um, second, I do want to put the 20 to 25 percent number in perspective in that more than 50 percent of patent cases settle after Markman. So you're having a whole bunch of district court claim constructions, orders that are never being reviewed by the Federal Circuit. So if, I don't want anyone to have the impression that one in four cases, the claim construction order of the district judge is getting reversed. It's much smaller than that because most of the cases are settling after that order. Um, I think in patent law, there's so many uh, venues where you can have do-overs, whether that's the board, whether that's the re-exam, then, I mean, look at Baxter, right? You can win in the district court, you can win in the federal circuit, and then you're going to go back and you're going to get reversed. So to say, oh, no, we need yet one more forum to let people, you know, litigate this further, I think, it, you know, if, if what the direction we're getting from the circuit is saying, let's try to narrow, streamline cases, let's try to save parties' costs to say, oh, no, no, let's create yet more forum, uh, more fora to have these issues litigated again, I think would be going in the wrong direction. I, I, I would just... Add one thing to what uh, Judge Coe said, which is even aside from adding more fora to decide these issues, um, Polk Wagner did this very interesting article studying empirically how the different judges and the different panels on the federal circuit had different claim constructions and came out differently. And I think even within the federal circuit, right, amongst the judges, and uh, the, you get quite divergent outcomes and you can get quite divergent outcomes. Judge O'Malley, is there deference at the Federal Circuit as a practical matter? I know there isn't as a matter of law. Are, do, do judges in a close case kind of tend to side with what the district court did? I mean, I know I've heard several judges on our court say that. Uh, um, Alan Laurie says it often, there, and, and I think that, that part of the problem is that sometimes, depending on who the judge is, they might give more deference if, that, if the district court <laughs> was likely to come out the way they did. In other words, if the district court is a spec person, a specification person versus a language person, um, or vice versa, you're going to get more, you're going to get some deference because they think, oh, that person's brilliant. You know, they think like me, so they must be brilliant. Um, I, you know, I there are lots of places that you can give deference. Our our court, I think, the the judges that have been on our court for a long time. St are still have ringing in their ears that the court was formed for purposes of uniformity, of creating uniformity in the patent law, that there was a fear that, that you know, somebody wanted to market a product nationwide and the product would be, you know, uh, marketable, the valid infringed patent in the Sixth Circuit and not in the Ninth Circuit. Um, you wouldn't be able to protect your intellectual property rights in some different circuit. So I do think there, that this question of uniformity um, and not having difference, as, as John says, is something that a lot of the judges still believe. I think it drove Cyborg in the long run. I mean, that's why I believe, and I am on, on record of saying this, so I, 
I, I, this is not speaking out of school, but I mean, that's why the arguments about the Supreme Court not calling it a question of law have sort of fallen off to, on deaf ears so far, I think, uh, because they are so concerned about the un uniformity. Uh, just w one thing I'd add, I mean, I, it seems to me that uh, the actual complexity to applying a principle of deference is the line drawing um, about what is an underlying fact and what isn't an underlying fact. Because if you're actually going to start parsing down and giving split deference so that if someone's evaluation of what a coined term means with two experts competing, that's a question of fact. But seeing which construction most aligns with the specifications, a question of law, it's all that line drawing, like, okay, what do we do now? And I think that's why, you know, the majority of the Federal Circuit judges will tell you, uh, you know, uh, I think in general that they have concerns about Cyborg's uh, accuracy or validity, um, but they don't quickly <laughs> uh, overturn it. Is because that line drawing, like what regime will be left? How do you how do you line draw then, and, and how do you apply this deference principle? Is such a quagmire. Well, let me let me ask a related question, right? Which is, um, in a world in which we didn't say this was a pure question of law, what facts matter to claim construction? What what evidence do you want that's outside, presumably, of the of the document of the patent and the prosecution history? I mean, the most obvious is expert testimony. So for example, one of the important canons of claim construction is whether a uh, putative claim construction would read on the preferred embodiment. Well, comparing a, an embodiment to a construed claim is, is the infringement exercise of applying a construction to an embodiment, and that's traditionally considered a fact. So to have different experts say, well, that would cover it, that wouldn't cover it, that kind of thing, that, I mean, to me, that's a classic example of where you can so logistically prove that there's underlying questions of fact or the validity principles and those kind of things. But I'm sure others have, have thoughts. Well, I, I think that you'll see if you go back and read it, before retractable, there was an earlier case where the issue of, of discussing deference came up again. And it was, I remember, everybody keeps citing it where they say, you know, so many, seven, seven just judges on the court said they would give some deference. And there were a couple of the judges on the court that said they would only give deference where there was truly an underlying factual issue and they'd give deference to those fact determinations. I, I think it's hard to differentiate and that I, again I said this in retractable. I think the, the bottom line is that where reasonable minds could come to different conclusions with respect to the claim construction, that that's where deference. W w a good example is, is in the retractable case, not only were there two district judges that went one way, but there was a dissent from the panel. So, so there were, you know, all in all, there were actually three judges who thought it should go the way the district judges did, and only two, but they happened to be the majority on the Court of Appeals. So I, I think it's, it's, it's more appropriate to say where, where, it's, where it's a question of falling off the fence one way or the other. Uh, obviously, you don't give deference to a, a poorly analyzed claim construction or one that's completely a field. Um, you'd say, well, even giving deference, this one's still wrong. Um, but but there, are, there are so many where it's really just a question of falling off the fence one way or the other. Well, I think one of the principles that I think should be uh, given more prominence in, in jurisprudence is the old principle that the, uh, that the claim should be construed to, with, a, with an eye towards ascertaining the, uh, ascertaining the invention which really goes to requiring, uh, to looking to validity issues in the claim construction. That used to be a first principle. That, the Supreme Court has described it as the first principle of claim construction. The Federal Circuit has put it more towards a, a, the last tiebreaker uh, in, in claim construction. And I, I think that's a, that's a real loss that, you know, we often, uh, the, 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 J Judge Rich a long time ago said the name of the game is the claim. And, and ever since then, patent law seems to behave that way, that the name of the game is the claim, and we're talking a lot about claims, but not a lot about invention. And I think we've lost sight of invention. The, 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 the older case law, I think, really tried not to have 200 claims and to play a game with claims, that if you could just get the right language, you could, you could get a good patent right, um, but instead, have a very small number of claims that are really tr where the where the where the judges really bend over backwards to try to make the claim language fit the non-obvious inventive contribution of that person. 
not try to have them, not try to have it sandbag the inventor, not try to say, well, you had an invention, but you know, use the wrong word. Um, I think that that's, that there, there's a degree to which the modern practice has focused way too much on claim construction and claim, is, claim wording issues uh, with, and losing sight of invention. So the evidence that I would champion would be looking to the evidence of what is the, uh, the inventive contribution, the non-obvious contribution of the inventor, and make that the, the pole star of, of claim construction. Now, I take it that part of the reason that, that the uh, canon of construing claims to preserve their validity has receded in significance is the sort of practical problem of timing under Markman. If we've decided that claim construction is a question of law that we're doing pretrial in a Markman hearing, uh, but that some of the validity questions uh, are, are going to be held for the jury, uh, it's awfully hard to know whether or not construing a claim in a particular way would render it invalid in order to trigger the presumption. But the Supreme Court never said, the Supreme Court did not say in Markman that Markman issues have to be decided first. It's true that that's the current practice, but that's, that there's not Supreme Court precedent that supports that. So, so let, me take, let me take that as a point of departure to, to ask now the question of uh, what happens once you've construed the patent claims. In my experience, uh, what we've done when we construe patent claims is we've taken words uh, written in the patent claim and we have uh, replaced them with other uh, theoretically clearer words, uh, often more words. Um, uh, what happens then is perhaps predictable, uh, which is patent litigators start fighting about the meaning of the words in the claim construction. Uh, and I, so I call this process meta-claim construction. Now we're fighting about the construction of the words in the claim construction. Is that a is that part of claim construction? Is that a question of law that we should be resolving pre-trial? Uh, is it something that you do once, you come up with a claim construction, and then you just throw the result to the jury, even if there's a dispute over what the claim construction means? I don't see how it could be anything other than a question. If the first qu inquiry is a question of law for the judge, I don't see how a subsequent clarification of it could be anything but that. Um, <laughs> I just don't get it on that issue. It seems to me it would have to go back to the judge for clarification and not to the jury. I think one of the biggest challenges in a, you know, for, for, for all participants is defining a line between the so-called step one and step two. What is, what is construing the claim? What is applying the claim? And to know when you sort of keep going down, you're defining the claim more and more and more to try to answer every question like some kind of manifest destiny, you know, you got to know when to stop on that. And so, you know, there are situations where I think people can say, okay, well now the construction doesn't answer the ultimate question. Well, that's not the purpose of the construction to answer the ultimate question. It's to define based on a legal document the scope of the right. Applying it's a whole separate question. I think preserving that second half of the equation um, is difficult in this day and age of, uh, of you know, cyborg and, and the whole claim construction process. It not, I mean, it's a challenge like anything else. It's not something out of control or something, but it's just something you've got to keep working at on a regular basis. Right, and based on my time at the district court, th this meta construction is usually just another way to, for them to try to get you to reconsider what, you, what you've done and to reverse your construction. So, I mean, I used to always say to them, I may be wrong, the Federal Circuit may tell me I'm wrong, but I'm rarely inconsistent. So I'm gonna stick with what I've done. And so I, I think there are times where maybe you can't anticipate every little nuance and that you do have to add something more, but I'd say most of the time, those arguments about not understanding your construction, even when it might be something that the, that the party proposed um, or that was very well discussed at, during the Markman hearing are usually just ways to, to get the judge to reconsider what they did. And does it differ if, I, well, I don't know whether as a district court you primarily adopted a party construction or whether you adopted your own. I can imagine it coming up more often if, if judge writes their own construction than if they adopt a party's construction because that presumably at least one party and maybe both of them think they know the implications of the party proposed construction. Well, one of the things, and the, one of the things that I used to always do is whenever the parties would say, we stipulate that this word can have its plain and ordinary meaning, I always used to say, write out what you mean by its plain and ordinary <laughs> meaning because that is so, so I got burned too many times because that would happen and then, 
you'd get to trial and then they'd argue over what the plain and ordinary meaning was. So it's, it's always important, I think, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And, and I'd, I'd have to say that, you know, there are judges who just say, I pick this person's construction or that person's, and then there are judges who will pick the one in between. I did some of all, depending on, on the case. But I think sometimes both parties go to such extremes that the real construction is the one in the middle because they're, they're trying so hard to, to get a construction that makes, you know, they want each term to, to make the whole case for them, uh, to carry all the water for the whole case. And so I, I think that, that you're often going to see a judge that might be in the middle. Judge Coe, is that, do you agree with that? Well, I, I was going to add on the plain and ordinary meaning. I see that a lot as well, where they just say plain and ordinary meaning. We don't need to do anything further on claim construction, but then they want to then clarify what plain and ordinary meaning. And I think if you if you committed that it's plain and ordinary meaning, then you're stuck. You don't get to then sort of reconstruct it or clarify what that means. If it's plain and ordinary, the jury will understand what it is. Um, I think often when people ask for more construction, they're really asking you to apply the construction and really sort of do a sort of infringement analysis for them. And so I agree with the Judge O'Malley. I mean, this is the construction and this is it. And there might be some instances where further construction or clarification is necessary, but in the vast majority of situations, I think the construction is the construction and just go forward and let the jury decide. I think in the situation where the parties state that plain meaning applies, that's essentially a consent to have the jury resolve any potential claim construction issue that's lurking in there in terms of a case management uh, concept or, or appellate analysis. And much like when parties give the obviousness question without qualification to the jury for general verdict, you can't then later try to unring that bell, you know, as long as the record's clear as to what you've done. So I think we might see an era where, where parties are getting pinned down to that jury consent when they're stating plain meaning more frequently. Well, I think again, this might uh, this this the the process itself is 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 placing way too much emphasis on parsing of language, um, and now we were not only parsing just you know the the litigation is not parsing the language in the claims; it's parsing the language in the Markman hearing, which is you know three steps removed from the invention and the inventive concept, which it seems like should hold. The, the, this should be the center of the trial, but but it, but is instead it becomes the claims, and now it's the the Markman ruling, and we're just getting further and further away from what should be the the the, the, sh the centerpiece, which is which is the inventive concept. And and I think, you know, we, we might talk about this later, but I, I think we'll talk uh, uh, having not a Markman hearing, but a validity hearing uh, as the first step in litigation is really. The solution to figure out whether the patent claim or the patent is an invention that's patentable and is a valid patent or not, that that should be the, the first step in litigation rather than claim construction. Claim construction might be a part of that, but that the entire piece is validity. Well, let's, so let's, let's take that up, right? So we, we, we heard earlier that claim construction in the Supreme Court's view is a mongrel practice, a sort of hybrid of legal and factual determinations, though it ultimately is one that's uh, uh, given by the Supreme Court to the judge rather than the jury to decide. We've got other such mongrel practices in, in uh, patent law, uh, among them uh, uh, enablement is a question of law dependent on subsidiary questions of fact. Obviousness is a question of law dependent on subsidiary questions of fact. Some but not all portions of Section 102, including the on-sale and public use bars, uh, are put in that category. Indefinite, uh, we don't know. What well, indefiniteness I, I, may, may or may not be, uh, depending on what opinions you read. Um, uh, should we be having obviousness hearings, enablement hearings, like we have Markman hearings, and determining these legal questions pre-trial before we then go to the jury? Yes. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I mean, I also teach tort law, to teach first year tort law, and duty, duty is a question of law that judges decide. They don't give that to the jury. And the duty is to what your duty is to avoid, what technologies you should be avoiding, and what technologies you are required to avoid, that I think is the equivalent of duty analysis in, in tort law. And the other question, the question of infringement, that is the question for the jury. That is the question of now that, that we've, a court has said, here's your duty, here's the duty of, of, of other competitors. 
And the question is, did this d accused defendant, did this accused defendant trespass or, or go beyond what it, what it could do? Did they breach their duty to the patent holder, breach the duty to avoid this technology? And that, I think, is a, is, a, is a much more rational way. It's not to deny that, there's a mix, that there are some questions of fact in there, but it's just to say that it's, it's, it's not something that should go to the jury. It's something that should be decided as a matter of law. And the Supreme Court has not said obviousness is an issue of law. It's not said novelty is an issue of law. It's said validity is an issue of law, all validity issues. That's what the court has said. That's Supreme Court doctrine. So. I'm not sure why we're, you know, mixing everything in and, and then certainly sending it all to the jury in an undifferentiated mass is, I think, clearly wrong. Can I just say, though, sure. if, it, if it really is potentially dispositive or even a close question, I think we do have those hearings, whether it's in the form of a motion for summary judgment, a motion for summary adjudication. If any party came and said, look, there's a dispos potentially dispositive on sale bar motion, I think any district judge would say, okay, well, let's go ahead and have that resolved early and first, because if this gets rid of the case, we're certainly happy with that. Um, so I, d I wouldn't say that there's no hearing, there's no evidentiary development, there's no um, process for a district judge to decide any of those issues. If they're close, I think the parties will raise them in some type of motion and get that decided first. I, 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 I'm not as optimistic as you that any district judge would do okay. that. Um, well. uh, maybe, maybe any district judge worth their salt would do that. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I do think the distinction then becomes between that, uh, that approach and the one that John uh, raises, what do you do when there is a disputed question of fact? Right uh, now, it might be that, frankly, if you get right down to it, there aren't that many cases that really turn on disputed questions of fact and patent validity. Right? We don't normally end up arguing about who's the person of skill in the art uh, or uh, uh, what is in the content of the prior art. What we end up arguing about is are the differences between the prior art and the patented invention sufficiently great that you deserve a patent? Um, and that's, I guess, the legal question, not the fact question. But there are going to be cases, and maybe in enablement there are more of them. Maybe after KSR, even in obviousness, there are more of them, right? Where the answer to the questions is going to depend on what would a person of skill in the art think. And the only way to figure that out is to go ask one or to ask an expert to serve as a proxy for one. Well, I mean, that sort of begs the question, which I think John was hinting at, and John and I may be the only two people in the room that still still believe that um, invalidity may be just for the court. In other words, following Markman, it may be a mixed question of law and fact, but it may be that because it's a public right, because of the, the history, um, that that's actually appropriate for the court, right? There's the Medalla case that I think John was involved with. Um, Chief Judge Nees has a dissent in the Lockwood case in the 90s saying exactly that in the Federal Circuit, sort of one of those little known facts. And the Supreme Court granted cert from the rejection of her position, and then that case was settled, so, or the, the issue was settled anyway. So that was never resolved. So there's, there's some interesting thinking about that, but with the I4I case that went up and people really haven't been pursuing this line of argument, it may be, uh, it may be too late in the day. I think facts are very important to things like obviousness. I, I notice I wrote down uh, Judge O'Malley's remarks. She talked about the importance of indi objective indicia of, of non-obviousness. Uh, she mentioned that, and that's something that, that the Federal Circuit has, I think, very correctly stressed. And, and I really like the, the way you phrased it, too, because you said objective indicia, not secondary considerations. <laughs> I think that that's, um, that's the right way to think about uh, uh, the, the facts. And I think they are very important. Uh, and, and my, my own writings on obviousness have, have, have tended to underscore a whole variety of factual questions. But merely because they're factual doesn't mean that a judge can't take testimony and decide, decide the issue um, as a matter of law. I think that happens in duty, duty issues where there's a, there's a question of what is a person's duty under a tort law or in, Mar in Markman hearings themselves. If, if, uh, if a judge thinks, I don't know what a person of ordinary skill in the art would think about a particular term, I think the judge is perfectly, it's perfectly appropriate for the judge to call in experts and have, have testimony given. And, and the judge then, the, the, the difference between this and the summary judgment process would be that the summary judgment process, the judge, if the judge gets down and says there's disputed issues of fact, then the judge simply rejects the, the summary judgment motion and says we got to go to trial on this. 
if you don't, if you say no, this is an issue of law for it's an issue of law based on underlying facts, but still it's an issue for the court. Then then they get decided in that pre pretrial conference. Now, to play devil's advocate a little bit, I mean, juries decide legal issues all the time. I mean, we this whole it's a, there's a legal element to it, so somehow I can't go to the jury. I mean, if a jury is deciding based on a certain set of facts whether or not someone committed murder versus manslaughter, they're making a legal determination. Um, and, and juries do that in all different contexts. So I don't, I don't know that they're incapable of, of applying facts to law at, or uh, considering mixed questions. And, and so a lot of that has to do with just philosophy on whether you think these things should be going to a jury or not. But, but I don't think it, it, that the law fact distinction is, is a, a clear enough one that you could say as soon as we call something a question of law, we can pull it out away from the jury. And, and if you remember Markman, the, 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 the thing that's most interesting about the Markman decision is the Supreme Court did not say that, that the reason it doesn't go to the jury is because it's a legal question. I and mean, that's why we're all arguing that they said it was a mongrel practice. But what the Supreme Court did was do this long historical analysis to say that this particular question was not historically, traditionally something reserved for juries. Now, whether that applies more broadly to validity um, uh, is a different question. But, I, but, the, but the Supreme Court didn't draw that law fact distinction for purposes of pulling it away from the jury. I agree with you. Is they did. They they obviously said it was a mongrel practice, and then they went through this functionalist analysis to try to figure out sort of which institution is better. Um, but I think if if you do that institutional, and I mean one that is one way to approach this question. But I think if you do that institutional analysis, you'd think that a court is better uh, to decide uh, validity issues. Um, after all, what's going on when an agent when when a court decides a patent is invalid, what a court is doing is they're engaging in judicial review of administrative action, right? They're saying the patent office erred in issuing this patent. There is Supreme Court precedent on the role of a jury in reviewing uh, administrative agencies. And the Supreme Court said in the 1940s, in a case not involving patents, but they said the jury has no role in engaging in review of the validity of an administrative action. It was very clear and very, I mean, it's, it's, it's surprising that that rule has not migrated. One of those two things is wrong, either the, and, and I think maybe the Supreme Court was wrong, the, the history is complex, but either the Supreme Court was wrong in saying this in, 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 in no uncertain terms, that the juries don't have any role in reviewing the validity of agency action, or the patent practice is wrong. One of the two things is wrong. John, I think there might be a law review article. Yeah, Mark and I are writing, yeah, Mark and I, we, we, <laughs> The moderator and I are co-authoring an article about the <laughs> jury invalidity, uh, so uh, the jury invalidity determination. Well, so let me, let me move us away from the mongrel practices, um, uh, although making one final note, which is the Northern District of California model patent jury instructions actually take two different alternative approaches to this question in the context of obviousness. Uh, one jury instruction says, uh, here, jury, is the question of obviousness. Give us a, a determination, but drops a footnote and says, obviousness is ultimately a question of law. And so, judge, you should treat this opinion as advisory. It is ultimately your decision to decide obviousness. The other uh, 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 verdict form uh, offered is one that does not ask the jury at all the ultimate question of obviousness, but, uh, but simply says, jury, tell us how you resolve these subsidiary factual disputes that the parties have. Who is the person of ordinary skill in the art? Uh, is there uh, evidence of commercial success, of long felt need, of failure of others, et cetera, uh, in the objective indicia? Um, and the jury only answers those questions. They don't answer the question of is the patent obvious? Um, so I think there are, we're, we're still working out the question of what exactly it means to be a mixed question of law and fact and, and who ends up making the decision. But one uh, a doctrine that we uh, have said across the board is not a mixed question of law and fact, but a pure question of law is patentable subject matter. Uh, now, we've heard a little bit already today about the Mayo uh, decision. Uh, it's clear that patentable subject matter is back, uh, though in exactly what form I think is still uh, open to discussion. Um, are there disputed questions of fact that might underlie a patentable subject matter determination? Is this just a question of I read the patent claims and I decide if they're too abstract or 
cover a law of nature? Uh, and isn't that something that we can do pre-trial? I mean, I would say based on if you were applying Mayo, which, you know, by speaking about it, I'm not in any way making any representation regarding the quality or reasoning of the decision, um, <laughs> then you could do analytic dissection, which is inconsistent squarely with Diamond v. Deere, which it ignored. Um, then if you're going to do the analytic dissection process, where you, where you erase everything that's prior art from the claim and then see what's left and then determine if that's a principle of, 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 of nature, um, you would need to, I think, have some factual analysis and development. Interestingly, the ultra-mercial case, which was uh, GVR'd today by the Supreme Court and remanded, was on a motion to dismiss. So it was on a Rule 12 on the, I mean, we're talking, you know, two, two months into the case or whatever it was, the motion must have been filed. Um, but I think if you're going to do the dissection process, notwithstanding everything in Diamond v. Deere, um, then you, you would need that, that kind of expert testimony. I, I can tell you what we're seeing. I mean, there is, if ultra-mercial, it did say that often it would be better to have claim construction first because how do you know if something's patentable subject matter if you don't know what's patented? Um, but then proceeded to say, but we don't really need to do that in this particular case. Um, we are getting a lot of cases from district judges who are doing it as a motion to on a motion to dismiss and that are not doing claim construction first. Um, I know that there are that you know that there are differing views on that, which. And, and this was very interesting to me because having seen so many of those, and you understand why. The district judge says, wait a minute, if this is not patentable subject matter, or it's close, and I have to fall off the fence one way or the other, I'm gonna fall off the fence early, and I'm probably gonna fall off the fence to find it unpatentable, because if I'm wrong, then I have three years of litigation before it ever gets decided by the Federal Circuit, and I will have wasted all of that time and energy, everyone's time and energy. So you understand why district judges might be inclined to do that. But, but what I thought was very interesting is that when we met with the patent pilot judges, um, so these are judges who care very much about the topic area, who have, have opted in, volunteered to do patent cases, and we did one of these you know, blind questions like you would press the button and it would come up with the results on the screen. We asked, how many, when do you think it should be done? And I think 76% of the responses said after claim construction. So they, they all believed, or virtually all believed, that claim construction was important to the 101 analysis. Now, I can't, I, I'm not allowed to guess where I think our court might ultimately go on that, but, but it, it's, it does just tell you where the most thoughtful judges are on that response. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, though, of course, that presumes that, that claim construction is going to matter, right? That is, um, uh, that, an, uh, that the 101 issue will turn on a dispute about the meaning of the patent claims, and that if, the, if one particular uh, uh, version is adopted, then it is patentable subject matter, and, and if the other one's adopted, then it isn't. And sometimes that's going to be true, although sometimes it might not be true. It sounds like in Ultramercial, you decided ultimately that was not true. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it seems to me that the, 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 the debated issue on Motion 101, based on my personal experience, is not so much the precise nature of the claim construction, but is more a policy question, um, which the Supreme Court seems to be answering one way, or, and or, you know, what the gist of the invention is. What's the gist of the invention, right? That's what the Supreme Court apparently, in its opinion, wants you to look at. I don't know how you do that without experts, unless you're doing it just based on the face of the specification, which seems uh, not appropriate because you don't, I mean, that may not be accurate yeah. as to what the actual state of the art is. Well, sometimes, some judges will say, even if I adopt the plaintiff's claim construction for purposes of this proceeding, so I'll give it, all to the patent holder, um, and, and then I still find it to be unpatentable. So some, sometimes, I think that's what happened in Ultramercial, which is why we decided we I, didn't need the exercise. Yeah. I, I do agree. I think it does it hinges less on claim construction and more on, as we saw in um, Mayo, for example, in the software space, um, what level of abstractness is too much or too little. And I think when, and what, uh, whether the invention precludes subsequent applications of a particular idea. And I think those questions, I mean, I think the 101 inquiry is one of law. 
Um, but I think there are underlying factual determinations in determining whether or not, for example, a claim is precluding other applications. And so um, I think uh, I th it should be, I think it can be decided both initially, depending upon the case, and then if there are a lot of factual underlying underpinnings, perhaps subsequently. Also, there's the, the question of conventionality, which is taken on increased importance after the uh, Mayo decision. And I don't know how you, uh, how a generalist judge decides whether something is conventional without knowing something about the technology. Um, and there's, the, indeed, one of the criticisms of the Mayo decision is that it sort of blurs in what we think of, what patent practitioners would think of as 103 issues or maybe 102 issues into the analysis. And I think that's, I think the Supreme Court would say that's, yeah, that, that's okay if it does that. It, because, you know, that, that 101 is, is aimed at the same policy issues. So it's not surprising that some of the things that are relevant for 103 analysis also affect 101 analysis. But to the extent that we acknowledge that, then 101, just like 103 or 102 or 112, does have underlying and subsidiary questions of fact. And it is just a validity issue, just like any other validity issue. Though, 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 you'd, issue. though you'd be happy to do that all pretrial. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you have to do it. I think, I think, I think they're all validity issues. I, I think you can't create a hierarchy of statutory issues. We do have some hierarchy uh, in the sense of jurisdictional issues. Jurisdictional issues generally have to be done first, although even there, there's some complexity to the law. Um, but besides that, I, I don't think I know of any other area where, where the courts say, oh, no, you've got to do this issue first because it's got an earlier statutory section number. Well, so le leaving aside the question of what section number it's in, let's, let's talk about this threshold inquiry issue. So in, in a recent case, the Federal Circuit um, <coughs> majority panel in the MySpace case said, 101's messy and unpredictable, and if you can avoid it, you should. And so here, where we've got a 102 uh, summary judgment issue before us as well, we ought to decide the 102 summary judgment issue uh, instead. The dissenting judge, Judge Mayer, said, no, 101's a threshold issue. The question, not because it's earlier in the statutory number, but because the question of whether this is the kind of thing that's eligible for patent protection at all is logically antecedent to the question of whether a patent is appropriate in the particular case. Uh, and so he says Section 101 always has to be decided first. After that uh, decision, the Supreme Court decision came down in Mayo, and at least some people have read Mayo as uh, siding with the threshold issue uh, uh, folks. Indeed, there are, uh, there's a district court decision in DC uh, that held that Mayo overruled the MySpace decision and that you had to do 101 first because it was a threshold question. Well, Judge Mayer's position is even broader than that. As I recall, in MySpace, 101 wasn't even raised, and so the, the parties didn't raise it. And so Judge Mayer believes that it's something that the court should do sua sponte. Um, and, and I think that is the more dramatic part of his position, not so much that if, if it's all presented, which one do you do first, but w essentially that there's no waiver if you don't assert 101 as a defense or don't attack it under 101. That, that he believes the court, even at the Court of Appeals stage, should, should raise it. I think that's the, that's the more dramatic part of his position. And I'm not going to express any opinion on it. But. <laughs> Threshold issue? I, mean, I agree with Judge, Judge White's statement before. It may be boring to say it, but uh, you know, some things are just case by case. I think the, the trial court needs to have the kind of dexterity to decide under the particular case facts and how, how the parties are presenting the issues and the nature of them, um, the sequence of issues. I mean, even, even John's chicken and the egg problem of claim construction validity, which comes first, right? I mean, it's sort of, they can't both come first, yet each one in some ways dependent on the other, um, you know, similar to 101. I think you, that really needs to be left in the broad discretion of the trial court uh, in terms of sequencing and relationship. Yeah, I guess I would um, not be in favor of Judge Mayer's incredibly rigid approach. I think exactly as Ed is saying, right, depending upon the case and as Judge Koh is saying, if there's an easy way to dispose of a matter, um, let's be pragmatists. Let's spare judicial resources and if there's an easy way to get rid of it, whether it's 102, 103, 112, 101, let's just take it. Well, what, do you, what do you think about the waiver issue though? So say, in MySpace, 
they ultimately ruled against the patent holder anyway, I think. It, so in other words, they could have they could have gone on, there were alternative bases that were raised, presented, and that they ruled judgment, on. Yeah. Yes, so w the, I think the question I want to ask yeah. and see what the panel thinks, and, and perhaps Judge Coe, is that if the district judge is never given the opportunity to rule on a 101 question, is that something that should be a threshold question at the Court of Appeals level? I, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's hard to, it's hard to come up with a clear uh, uh, statement that says this is jurisdictional, right, in the That's sense that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, other things that are unwaivable really are. Uh, although I will say as a litigator, uh, I can reasonably guarantee you that after Mayo, nobody's going to present that problem for you because nobody's going <laughs> to not argue 101. <laughs> I, 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 amidst the fog, there's... There's one clear thing in terms of prioritization. I like to see the Federal Circuit not decide any 101 issues, at least for the next few years, so that nothing gets fed up to the Supreme Court for further uh, yeah. making. And yeah, I'm they're, not, they're just gonna they're just gonna let the case yeah. backlog increase, and yeah. yeah. No, and, I, and I'm not right. gonna our, our entire docket's gonna become 101 cases. And I'm not <laughs> suggesting you hold the Myriad case until uh, Justice Breyer retires or anything like that. But for the sake of everybody, you might do that. I think, would, I think, Mark, you're absolutely right that it's very hard to say that a statutory issue like this is, is jurisdictional and that it goes that, you know, parties' waivers and other things like that can't be considered. There's a very, very our system is generally an adversarial system. That's the baseline. There's a very, very small set of issues where we do not rely on the adversarial process and, and the courts can raise the issues sua sponte. Those are generally limited to jurisdictional issues. Well, though, John, I think once, court. once, if we buy your story that it's all a question of law, right, we get a little, little more flexibility for the court to say, well, gosh, validity is a question of a law, but validity is before me. Um, you know, you're, uh, you lose on the law, although, albeit for a somewhat different reason than the district court thought, right? I, I, I still think we have waiver on issues of law just because it's something that's an issue of law and that I could have won on it had I just had my lawyers raised on it doesn't mean that the court has, certainly doesn't mean the court has an obligation to raise it. Now sometimes courts do write opinions where that, the issues weren't briefed. If you, if you look carefully at the briefs, you realize that, that you know, the, the issues were decided in a different ground than what they did and whether that's proper is another question, but I don't think there's any judicial obligation to do that. Um, so, okay. All right, finally, outside of the jurisdictional context. Final topic I want to turn to is uh, is uh, procedures for dealing with damages cases. As, as Judge O'Malley mentioned in her speech, there have been a, a number of movements in the Federal Circuit uh, regarding damages calculations, the Unilock case, uh, and some others. Uh, uh, among other things, took rather seriously the, the role of um, uh, gatekeeping and, uh, and Daubert challenges to uh, sometimes dubious economic uh, justifications for, for uh, parties' patent validity case. Uh, so the question I, well, the first question is, um, is a Daubert hearing mandatory on patent damages? Do we always have to decide pretrial? Um, whether or not the uh, expert's economic evidence comes in? I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never seen any principle of law that that could possibly, first of all, the hearing itself, as anyone that practices in district courts know, no hearing is guaranteed. So you certainly don't have the right to be heard orally. Um, in terms of whether you have a right to a decision on a Daubert uh, pretrial, I think that can't be right. I mean, you don't have a right to a summary judgment ruling it would seem hard to say that you have a right to an expert ruling considering that the justification of most judges in punting on Daubert is well they can clean it up on the back end in the post-trial uh, and post-verdict motion practice. So that's my thought. Is that right? that you can clean it up afterwards? I mean, it seems to me one of the problems has been, uh, uh, well, all right, um, uh, I let in evidence on the 25% rule of thumb and the, and the uh, uh, plaintiff's expert testified at it and the judge issued an award of damages which is just a number. Um, and now it turns out that the 25% rule of thumb is, uh, is no good uh, and I shouldn't let it in. What do I do with that if I'm a district court? I have to have a new trial by definition because I let in the wrong evidence. Do I? Is there a way to correct that after the fact? I, mean, I, just, I, 
I didn't mean to suggest some post-trial correction process that's unique to this area of law. You have a, a JMAL, and you determine if there's legal sufficiency or, or a new trial, and you determine great weight or or otherwise, and then, yeah, you may, you may, in that case, from what I'm hearing from you, you'd have to have a new trial on just damages, keeping in mind the way the district judges, I think, think of it, um, being as efficient as they often are, is 90% of the time, you're not gonna get into that box. It's gonna settle, you're gonna get a resolution that's no liability, so you'd never have to approach it. And there's all kinds of ways which you avoid the problem, but if the problem ends up manifesting, then you apply your post-verdict tests and give the relief that's appropriate under the circumstances. Although I guess, I'm, I guess I'm a little troubled by the idea that, you know, what, we'll just let the plaintiffs come in with their $5 billion number and we'll sort it out at the back end if and when it goes to trial, but don't worry because most of those cases will settle. Well, if I get to take my $5 billion number to the jury, the case may well settle, but it may well settle for something rather different uh, than it would have settled for if, if uh, we'd excluded the improper evidence in the first place. Right? So I guess your question, Mark, is, you know, if the parties submit their Dalbert motions, right, I mean, I don't, I don't see any way, I mean, the district court court judges have quite a bit of discretion on when and how they rule upon that, right? So I, as a party, I'm not sure there's a lot one can do other than submit the motion. I don't think a mandamus motion is going to work. <laughs> yeah. the, the, what's, what's interesting is that, that in all my years on the district bench, I never saw an attack on a damages expert in a patent case via Daubert. I mean, they, it just seemed that lawyers focused all on the science, and they would just let these economists, and since I had an economics degree, it used to drive me crazy, say whatever they wanted to say. And there were very rarely any objections. So this whole 25% rule, I used to hear people argue about it all the time, but no one ever really objected to it. I mean, it was, the, you know, they'd, they'd go through trial, they'd say they hated it, but no one ever challenged it as, as really as a matter of economic theory. Um, so I, I don't think that you see a lot of those. I'm guessing now you'll, either parties just won't bother to try, or you're gonna, it's just gonna be a simple motion in limine where they exclude a particular topic area from being discussed or a particular opinion from being expressed. Um, but uh, I, I just don't, I don't think that there's enough attention to the, the weakness in economic theory with respect to damages expert, and it's not just patent cases, but I think that's true across the board. Something that Northern District uh, Patent Rules Committee is looking at is coming up with a way to vet damage contentions to add the focus that, that Judge O'Malley referred to and avoid the dilemma that, that Mark referred to of this sort of game of chicken pre-trial about putting the district judge in the position to sort of destroy someone's damages case right on the eve of trial, which requires either letting them go in naked or having a new expert and then delaying and blowing the trial date by tr bringing things earlier. The problem is that that puts a heavy burden on both parties, uh, both in terms of discovery and you know, essentially developing an expert report early point. We haven't been able to find the right balance yet in how you can sort of join up the um, legal adequacy of the damages case early enough to avoid the game of chicken at the end while not creating mass expense early when oftentimes claim construction, for example, might resolve the case without the need for all that. So talk to your local patent committee member or anyone else and. So you're going to know Judge Coe had, um, you know, I have talked about this a lot. And Judge Coe, have you had this situation come up? What do you, what do, you do about uh, uh, Dalbert hearings pre-trial or damages contentions pre-trial? Well, the Dalbert motions are heard with summary judgment motions just because a lot of times the issues are interwoven anyway. And that's early enough that there's still time to cure if either a theory is going to be excluded or an expert's going to be discluded, excluded. Um, so I think the bar has done an, a good job of educating the bench that these need to be done early enough that there's time to cure. And so uh, even if they're done at a motion and limine stage rather than with summary judgment, I still think you know, most members of the bench are doing them sufficiently early enough that you can cure any, any deficiencies. Okay. Uh, why don't I open the uh, floor to questions uh, from the audience. Again, if you would have a question, uh, you are, please come to the microphones. Rob. So I can't help but ask about Mayo uh, and how it might apply to abstract ideas or computer-aided process claims more specifically. Uh, so it's, you know, it, you, it might be possible to 
go through the Fluke analysis based on the law of nature and exclude the particular steps that involve the law of nature. But when it comes to abstract ideas or algorithms, then the whole process might be the algorithm. And that just seems to beg the same question of, is this an abstract idea or not? So how, how, do you, how much do you think the Mayo decision really reads on the abstract idea doctrine? Mark, you've got to answer that. I know you spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it. No, I mean, you're the, one of the leading experts yeah. on that topic. I, so, well, look, I mean, I think it's a mess, um, right? I, I, although, to be fair, right, I actually, I, I think the same sorts of problems end up infecting the product of nature uh, cases, too, right? So uh, it is the case that if you look at software patents, um, a, a uh, you know they will generally take the form a processor programmed to perform steps X Y Z and Q uh, and if in fact we took seriously the Parker versus Fluke idea combined with the with the Gottschalk versus Benson idea that mathematical algorithms are not themselves patentable and you exclude all the things that are not themselves patentable from consideration in deciding patentable subject matter uh, that claim reads as a processor. Uh, and then you read Mayo and you say, well, gosh, a processor is conventional activity. It's well known in the art, uh, must be unpatentable. Um, that doesn't seem a ter terribly satisfying way to think about it. Um, I mean, I, I think, uh, one possibility, um, I, you know, when we had this conference uh, on IP and biosciences a month ago here in this very room, uh, you know, John Duffy, I think, took the position that, um, well, the problem is with Mayo is it was a lousy patent claim, uh, right? All the Supreme Court really agreed on was in the, in the natural products world, this lousy patent claim, which is just uh, 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 mostly about the product of nature, that's unpatentable. I think that's a bit harder to position to sustain after today's uh, 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 GVR. The, it's not a precedential decision uh, to vacate uh, the ultramarital decision. On the other hand, it seems like the Supreme Court thinks Mayo has some implications for uh, software. Um, you know, I think it might be, um, you know, I think it might well be the case that uh, there's a way to look at the sort of breadth or narrowness question um, uh, without uh, having to go all the way to Parker versus Fluke. Uh, I think you could sort of take from Mayo the, uh, the conclusion that uh, if all you've done is take uh, things well known in the art and apply them in a different context. I took things that were already well known and I did them on the internet. Uh, and you know, there's a way to read the ultramarital claim in, the, in which that's exactly what it did. Um, that that's uh, too abstract. That's not tied to any particular novel implementation. And the, the difference in Neo now is that you need, we need some sort of particular novel implementation. Um, but I, you know, but I got to say, you got to read Mayo with a particular squint in your eyes to sort of get there and no further, to not get to the place that says all these software patent claims are invalid. Uh, since I was mentioned, I'll give a, a, a small comment. First, the ultramercial GVR. I think if you know Supreme Court practice really well, you think GVRs are like water. It's a good way for the Supreme Court to just get rid of the pile of surpetitions that are on that issue that have stacked up in the holding docket while a case has been there. They do not put much of any thought to them. Um, so I think, you know, the, the patent world has, has read a lot into, oh, they GVR'd Ultramersal. They must have thought about it. And the crucial problem is that they, did, they, they d do not think about it. There's a lot of big fish being fried at the Supreme Court this term. They are not, uh, what happens at the GVR process is the law clerk, one of the law clerks from the chambers that wrote the opinion, which means the, Breyer's cha the Breyer chambers, looks at the things and makes a, a recommendation. And the court thinks it's not precedential. There's no way we can make a mistake here. Um, so they do not really supervise these decisions very carefully in the sense that it's just to send back to the, to the Court of Appeals and, we'll, and, if, and if the party's dissatisfied with that, they'll, or one of the, either party is dissatisfied, they, are, they have full rights to bring it back to us. Um, so it's just a matter of convenience for them. And as far as you know, a narrow reading of Mayo, you know, look at history, look at Parker versus Fluck. You know, if you read Parker versus Fluck, you'd think you know, claim dissection and everything else and, and lots of things that are bad. 
And then, you know, a few years later, Diamond versus Deere comes, uh, comes down. Um, the, that's the way the Supreme Court works. It tacks one way and then the other way. If you've got an opinion that has inside of it two inherently conflicting principles, one of which is you, you read out all natural principles, all natural insights are just not available for your invention. And the other that the court recognizes, if you do that with rigor, the patent system is destroyed. If you take those two you know, inconsistent principles and the court's going sort of back and forth between them, it's not surprising you're gonna get some degree of inconsistency in the jurisprudence. So the next case out of the court will tack the other direction, right? Bilski went one way, this case gone the other way. Stay tuned. Maybe. Seem to be they both went the same direction, but all right. Um, uh, uh, all right, we got four. Uh, uh, we got four people left and four minutes. Uh, uh, so um, quick, brief. Very, very brief. Uh, I hope this isn't too parochial as a Silicon Valley economist, but uh, Congress, in its wisdom, has left the damages damages to the courts. Uh, but my experience in going to the courts, similar to what we just heard here, is very little attention is paid to it, few resources go into it, so nothing really gets up to the Fed Circuit where Randy Raiders obviously wants to fix this problem. So how are we going to get quality evidence uh, up to the court? I put Judge Alsop aside because he's really doing uh, yeoman's efforts on that. So. Stop settling your cases. I mean, yeah. I, I, mean I, th I think that, I mean, I guess I, I don't necessarily fully accept the premise. I mean, I think people are putting a lot of focus on damages, damages issues more and more in both, in every way at the district court level. So, so I'll speak just on behalf of my company, and that is um, in all of our cases, we are actively looking for damages issues to develop the case law in a manner that we wish. And we're also reaching out to our counterparts, our peer companies, whether they're in our industry or not, to tee up the issue. And we're also looking to startup companies who may not have the financial resources to push forward a case all the way through to tee up the issue to the federal circuit. But I think it's incumbent upon us to, as Mark says, not settle these cases and get some good law developed. I mean, there's been a lot of good work with Unilock and RescueNet and so forth and Lucent, and there's a lot more to be done. And it was pretty clear through patent reform that the damages law was not going to get reformed through legislation. So I think the most uh, fruitful path is probably through judicial reform. Julie. Quick too. Thank you guys so much. Um, I, I think a lot of what you talked about today, which was so interesting, also explains why patent litigation to some extent is a sport of kings and, and the barrier to entry is really high. Markman hearings, um, and, and I think what that has done is kind of created an environment, a very dangerous cottage industry of non-practicing entities going after the small guys who don't feel like they can fight back, which is why I was so relieved to see Mayo and, and this reaffirmance of 101 as a threshold issue and I might be in the minority in this room, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit and, and briefly um, about other things that help kind of keep the, the district courtroom doors open that can give incentives to parties to fight back to make the good law, not just on damages, but, but you know, throughout the entire um, patent system. I mean, I, so without going into the debate over sort of which direction patent law is skewed and, and into the general patent trolls thing, I, so I, let me throw out one, uh, which is fee shifting. Right, I mean, I think one of the significant, there's a significant economic chunk of cases that are entirely about uh, the fact that it costs $5 million to take a patent case to trial. Uh, and some percentage of those cases would go away if we had a credible threat that there was fee shifting for frivolous litigation. And you know, so far we haven't really had that, but we might. Yeah, I mean, we had a case at the Federal Circuit and, and it, it came up and the, the record showed that what, these, the, what the, the patent holder would do would file a lawsuit and then immediately say, pay, you know, pay me somewhere between seventy dollars and $100,000 to go away. Well, who's going to not pay that? And what happened is almost everybody did. Yep. To, and then the person had uh, plenty of money to litigate you know, more cases. So then somebody decided to fight it, and it came all the way up and we af affirmed the, the decision throwing the case out and awarding sanctions, fee shifting in that particular instance. But I remember sitting there with my law clerk saying, you know, it's amazing that this company chose to take this risk because it's a big risk because you might not get that fee shifting award. You might not get the um, affirmance at the Court of Appeals. But, but I, and, and perhaps they had help. Perhaps there were others who, who sort of joined in with them and helped them fin finance it, but it was important that they did it. Yeah. 
and it is right. It's the on that case, and mm -hmm. and the yeah. It is what's notable about it is there's nothing notable about it except that it actually made it to the federal circuit. Right. So this is this is an interesting issue because Mark had on his outline, um, which we didn't get to, the notion of reverse bifurcation, which is having the district court judges hear the issue of damages first. And I think where it's particularly helpful is oftentimes in these troll cases, where the amount of damages alleged um, is not very high compared to the cost of defense. So their leverage really is, look, you either pay the, your lawyer or you pay me a small amount. And I think, I mean, there are pros and cons to reverse bifurcation, and that's probably a whole other conference and debate, and there have been law review articles written on it. But I think there's a lot to be said about thinking about that in some cases. The other thing I'd add is that uh, discovery limits, you know, obviously the e-discovery thing, but I was talking to someone on the Civil Rules Committee. Apparently the Civil Rules Committee for the Federal Rules is thinking of relatively drastically reducing hours, the, the default on the hours of a deposition to about half day and the number of depositions below 10. So I think just sort of, I'm not validating that, I'm just saying that discovery limits is one way to sort of keep the doors of justice open for people. So going back to the question of deference, I wonder whether we haven't lost sight of the real question we should be asking, which is if Judge Coe thinks that a claim means X and that's wholly reasonable, and Judge O'Malley thinks a claim means Y, and that's wholly reasonable, and her fellow panelists think it means Z, and that's also wholly reasonable, then how is that claim valid? Is it not the purpose of a claim to set out the mets and bounds? How is one skilled in the art is supposed to interpret a claim which people reasonably differ as to the meaning, people very knowledgeable about this subject matter? It's not the right qu question for all these reversals, if reasonable minds differ, how can the claim be valid? Yeah, I, so, and by the way, I, I will note that that is the rule at the patent office, right? So if there are two equally plausible determinations, that patent is rejected for indefiniteness. Now, the consequences of rejecting for indefiniteness at the patent office are rather less than the consequences of rejecting for indefiniteness in the, in the litigation process because you get to go back and rewrite the claim in clearer terms. Um, so I'm not sure you want to go that route, uh, although, I mean, I will say I think, I think indefiniteness is actually one of the areas of law that uh, we ought to look to in the next few years as something that if the Supreme Court ever picked it up, the law would look rather different than it does right now. Um, so maybe you want to then think about is there some kind of a, uh, if there are two reason, equally reasonable constructions, pick the narrower one. Sometimes that'll benefit the accused infringer, though sometimes it'll benefit the patentee depending on what the legal issue is. I, well, I, I think it's. I think you're ag exactly right. That if you have a patent system where people have to write 240 claims or 800 claims, uh, then it's a it's a not it's not a good functioning system. If you if you bought a house and said here's the deed to your land, and your attorney said here's the deed to your land, and there are 240 different mets and bounds, one of which might be right or none, you would think you'd be nervous. I would think. Um, and that is the system that we have today. And it's not historically the way it was. I mean, if you go back and look at, you know, Edison's patent or the Wright brothers' patent, you know, maybe they had 10, 10 20 claims. Um, but we've just, the name of the game has been the claim for the last 20 years. And I think that that, I think we've seen the effects of that and hopefully things will change in the coming years. Roberta. A couple of things. First. Three interpretations of the same claim don't bother me if they're three different pieces of language and if they're three different devices. Um, I don't think you can talk about three different interpretations in the abstract. Uh, second, a lot of people have been saying things like, don't settle your case. That's true, spoken like a true lawyer and not like a true client. Mm -hmm. Clients are in the business of doing their business. Litigators are in the business of litigation. Let's be a little bit empathetic with our clients. Um, third, uh, with just a Brief note on the Seventh Amendment ought to be amended constitutionally so that it says juries get to try cases if they can be tried in a week. We don't need juries to decide all sorts of things that don't depend on sweaty palms credibility. When you have two experts, what the credibility is really is, is it logical? Does it make sense 
on the written documents. That's not really something a jury is really ideal for, and that gets to uh, Professor Duffy's point about institutional appropriateness. Last, on the burden of proof, lots of points here. You can take up any of you like. Uh, on the burden, uh, the burden of proof is often ignored in claim construction. In claim construction, the ones I've seen, they're always pretty much 50-50 because that's why they're being argued. The litigators are really clever. They see that they're, it's ambiguous, and so they go for the ambiguity. Okay, that's great. Now let's say if it's a validity question that the claim construction matters for, then let's use the burden of proof for validity, and we'll, ha we'll have an answer right away if it's 50-50. Again, if claim construction goes to infringement, again, easy to decide if you just look to the burden of proof. We do that for summary judgment. I don't know why we don't do it for claim construction. Although, and I'll uh, let Professor Lemley, who I've already mentioned these things to, attack me. Well, I, I, will, say, I will say only on the last point. Um, uh, the clear and convincing evidence presumption of validity is an evidentiary presumption. It applies as the Supreme Court's concurring opinion in I for I makes clear only to questions of fact, not to questions of law. So if we think claim construction is a question of law, um, uh, there's no reason to think that there's a burden, that there's a presumption that way. If we think all of validity is a question of law, I'm not sure where that takes us. There will there be subsidiary factual questions on which we defer, but not on the ultimate legal question. I'm, I'm happy to chime in on the. Yeah, right. So, put myself since you are the in, you're the in-house yeah, so, person. So I'm in the I'm in-house counsel, and every time a patent claim comes to us and we think it lacks merit, we think, ah, what do we do? And I mean, this was true when we were a small company, and you know just trying to make revenue, not today's a very different situation, but keep in mind that every penny that is paid to these folks, I mean, this is a repeat business. These are sophisticated players, and the money that you will give them, they will use it to either buy more patents to then come against you and or others, or they'll buy it and go after the rest of the industry, get some money from other folks, and then buy another set of patents. So it's not as if, you know, you settle it once, it's gone, you never have to deal with it. All right, Judge White. If the uh, claim is properly construed and there's no debate as to what the accused device does, is there any issue for the jury? And I assume, based on the analogy with that Professor Duffy does with duty and um, whether or not somebody breached duty, the, the answer is probably yes. There could be something for the jury, but. I'm curious as to what the panelists think and if there is an issue for the jury, what, give me an example. I, so this is, I actually think this is, um, uh, uh, this goes to this meta claim construction question, right? So if we're, uh, we've construed the patent claims, we know we agree what the defendant's device does and we're still fighting about whether or not the patent claims cover that accused device. Is that fight a question of claim construction? We just haven't gotten the construction right yet. Or is it a fight about some factual infringement issue? I read several of the Federal Circuit's recent decisions as, as resolving that question uh, as saying it's a question of claim construction. There's a, there's a recent opinion that actually presents the meta claim construction question and the Federal Circuit basically says, well, uh, that's a question of claim construction and so it needed to be resolved by the judge in JMAL as a part of whatever uh, a cleanup of understanding of the claim construction was. Um, I, I feel pretty confident that there are certainly situations where you could have the fact question remain that's the application of a proper claim construction. The, just the first thing that comes to mind is terms of degree, such as substantially, l largely, whatever the term of degree is. Why you have a term of degree is that it has to be contextual to the embodiment that's under study. So you can't, apply, you can't translate every term of degree into a numerical range, I don't think. So I think in order for the answer to that question to be yes, every term of degree would have to be able to be translated as a function of claim construction into a, range, a numerical range. I don't think that's possible. So I think the fact finder has the job of saying, okay, it has to be substantially, A has to be substantially larger than B in the context of this system, and then that's what the jury decides. I can't believe there would be a world where that would always be a question of claim construction. That doesn't make any sense to me. And, and same on the invalidity side. Um, there is one, I'm not talking so much about, Mark is a little more focused on the O2 micro problem of when is sort of what about the leftover claim construction problems. But on this, on the question framed by Judge White, which is, is it necessarily a question of claim construction infringement? I think, you know, just the, the basic two-step process tells you it's not. But uh, 
you know, but I, but I, I just think that we need to leave some role for the jury. In so, that. but so, what's the fact question there? Is it what does substantially mean? That's a fact. No, question? it's in this system is a substantially larger than b. Without and we, we we do that without knowing what substantially means. Or we we uh, you you use the, your, your the, the sense that you have in the context from the expert testimony and everything else in the context of the prior art to make that judgment. <laughs> Otherwise, there just would be no. I mean, if that's true, taken to its logical conclusion, there is no jury role in infringement. And I just don't, unless, I mean, that would be revolutionary. There's unless there's least. a dispute over the what fact. the defendant's product actually does. The, right. and, that's, right. and, that's what the, and that's what juries should do. They should decide what has gone on in the real world when there's hotly disputed questions of fact about, you know, what did the person do? But beyond that, if, if the question really is what, what is the legal obligation of all citizens to avoid, whether it's to avoid this technology or not to avoid this technology, that seems like a question of law. Okay, last question. One quick question now. Um, given everything on claim construction, should the uh, Federal Circuit begin to possibly entertain interlocutory appeals on claim construction from the district court? Just one short question. <laughs> You know, I, I, I joke that I used to have a different view of this when I was on the district bench, but um, I actually think there is an area where interlocutory appeals are completely appropriate, and that is the situation, and I actually tried to certify one up back when I was on the district bench and it wouldn't go, but where it's very clear that claim construction A will, will read directly on the, the product and will resolve infringement. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, where claim construction A will, will require the conclusion that there's no infringement. If, if that, whereas claim construction B doesn't necessarily determine infringement but leaves the issue open. And if you then say to yourself, if, that, if, the, if the issue's presented early and the judge says, okay, I go with B. So in other words, I don't enter summary judgment in favor of the, the putative infringer, I say the litigation has to go on because my claim construction is B. In that circumstance, I think you ought to be able to certify it up and to say because A would be determinative the other way and would prevent years of litigation, that the system that we have under 1292B should be sufficient to allow our court to take interlocutory review. And I have pitched this many times um, and debated it with Chief Judge, former Chief Judge Michelle, um, and, and at least my understanding is that if that issue presents itself, the court is willing to at least consider the possibility. I don't know the, of them ever taking interlocutory appeals in, right. otherwise, and I don't know if it will happen, but I, I haven't changed my view on that. I think in that circumstance, we should consider it. Because the alternative is, uh, uh, we have interlocutory review right now, we just call it summary judgment. Right. If, you go, if you go the A route, you get a re resolution on this question, right. um, uh, but only if you go in one direction. Because what you do is you almost encourage the district judge to, to do something that's in, not intellectually honest, which is to, to go the A route just to get it up. And you don't want to put a district judge in that position. You want the district judge to make the decision they think is clearly the right one, but, but give an opportunity for it to be tested early on. All right, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>